There's a little satellite made of Legos. Isn't that cool? The last time we met, we were talking about spinning of symmetric things. So things where two principal moments of inertia are equal and the third one's different. It could either be larger or smaller than the ones that are equal. And you get slightly different kinds of motion. If all of the moments of inertia are unequal and you just have a general rigid body, and we're talking about out in space, it's called the free rigid body, torque free, even with no torque on it, it does those weird motions. If you get nothing else from this course, know that the intermediate axis is unstable. Okay. So you've got your shape. Uh, everyone loves the potato. Here's my potato shaped spacecraft. And let's call this B1, B2, B3. And don't be thrown off by, oh, the labels, they mean something. No, 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 no. So from the mass distribution, you calculate, no matter what these are labeled, I could call them uh, Frank, Bob, and Joe. From the mass distribution, you calculate the principal moments of inertia and the corresponding directions, which are the principal axes. And in that frame, the moment of inertia becomes a symmetric, and well, just to be clear, this is the moment of inertia about the center of mass, moment of inertia about the center of mass in a B frame, a body fixed frame, that's a principal axis frame, this will be diagonal. So we could say I1, I2, I3. But then what really matters is what are the relative sizes of these? They're all going to be positive, but they will have some ordering. So there'll be a direction about which the moment of inertia is the maximum. You can call it the maximum inertia axis. It's sometimes called the major axis. And then there's the intermediate moment of inertia. And then the, there's a corresponding principal axis direction. And th then the minimum moment of inertia. Anytime you have three positive real numbers, you're going to tend to have an ordering of them. We'll call it the maximum inertia. So it has a corresponding maximum inertia axis. This value itself is the maximum inertia. And it'll be in uh, kilograms meter squared. Everything's going to be measured that way. Intermediate will be some kind of intermediate axis. And then the minor or minimum inertia axis. And this one is definitely, the intermediate one is unstable, meaning... If you're spinning about it, you're, at, you're going to flip. It's not technically chaotic because it's periodic. You'll flip and you'll do these periodic flips. So kind of pointing the way you want to and then pointing the opposite way. But that's you know, no good. You don't want that. That's a, that's a bad scene. An object that has this property would be basically any general object that is near you. It's going to have three different moments of inertia. But some people thought they were clever in calling this the tennis racket theorem. I'm not too thrilled about that because a tennis racket is weird shaped. Let's admit it. I used to play tennis in high school and then I just you know stopped. So a tennis racket, if you think about its mass distribution, I mean, I don't know where the center of mass is, maybe somewhere around here, but it definitely has a minimum axis. Remember, minimum means where when you integrate, you're integrating the mass that is perpendicular to that axis. So there is a minimum axis. I think it's this one. So we could, just for labeling purposes, I'll call that I min. That means there's the minimum moment of inertia, and it's about that direction, spinning about that direction. The most mass is perpendicular to what I've shown here. So the most mass is coming out of the screen at you, call that I max. I don't mean the domed theater. And then there'll be an intermediate axis, which is the other direction. You know, what's the other direction? There's got to be some other direction. So that's got the intermediate moment of inertia. So if you were to toss this, you toss a tennis racket, it is going to be stable about its major axis. You know, you, I don't know if you toss the tennis racket. If you try tossing about this intermediate one, you will see a tumbling. It seems to happen so quickly that it's not obvious. So this tennis racket theorem just makes it sound fancy. That means that rotation starting near the intermediate axis is unstable. And we showed that last time the book uses the intersection of the angular momentum sphere and then varying the energy. And that just shows this plot of these curves and for the along the minimum and the maximum direction, right? We have things that look stable. And the intermediate axis, there's a direction that shoots off. There's also a direction coming in, but there's a direction that shoots off. And if you have a direction that goes away, that makes something unstable. 
So you, you might say, but you know, what if I exactly get it along that intermediate axis that's equilibrium? Right? Yeah, well, that's not going to happen. There's going to be a little bit of a nudge, right? And Adam hits it, and then, oh, no, it's unstable. So it's unstable. And you don't need a tennis racket to see this. You could use your phone. Since everyone has a phone, maybe we should start calling it the phone theorem. I have an iPhone. At some point in grad school, my advisor let me use a Mac, and that just sort of set the stage. I was stuck with Macs. I just couldn't deal with PCs. They uh, frighten and confuse me. Anyway, here's a phone, and here are the different axes for said phone. Take your phone out. Where's my phone? Here's my phone. Got a phone. Right. And we could deduce, hopefully, what are the directions of minimum and maximum. Seems like if I spin it, I'll put an axis here. If I spin it about this axis, that'll be the minimum axis I'm in. And then if I spin it about this axis, that's maximum. It's got the most mass normal to that, which means that the odd one out is the uh, intermediate axis and the black sheep of the axes. And if you try to toss your phone about that direction, it'll tumble. And it's easier to see in slow motion. It don't do it over concrete. Here's an iPhone being thrown, tossed into the air about its maximum axis. And look, it's nice and stable. I don't see any tumbling in this slow motion video. And then about the minimum axis, wow, stable. Now try to do the intermediate and oh no, it tumbles. That's not good. You don't want that. You don't want that. Here's another view from a simulation. Back before we had phones, we had books. And so this was sometimes called the book toss. Some of you have books. So this is just showing something spinning about that intermediate axis and we're just sort of drawing the axes. And then you see it, it goes to the other side. So this would be, if you were to track what the phone is doing in the air. Um, yeah. When I grew up, all we had were blocks of wood. So if we wanted to see this. Yeah, and so this, obviously, you don't want your spacecraft to do this. Um, well, hey, maybe you do. I don't know. I'm not going to tell you how to design your spacecraft. Here is, uh, it's not tossing a book, but here's on the space station, right? So in free fall, microgravity, they've got this weird shaped thing that I guess has um, an intermediate axis and they're getting it spinning about the intermediate axis. I think it's like a, a bolt thing. So they get it spinning and look what it does. It like jumps from side to side. Woo, woo. I mean, it, that's cool. And it just uh, comes from this weird effect. It, it, it's not intuitive, right? Particles don't do this. This thing will go on forever, seemingly. So it looks like a lot of motion without any input of energy, but it can happen. There it is. Frightening, I know. So spinning about the intermediate axis is unstable. Uh, there's a question. Can you calculate the number of rotations before a flip? Yeah, I, I think it has to do with how close you start to exactly near the intermediate axis. So you could probably pick any number of rotations before you flip, depending on how close you start exactly to that intermediate axis. Experimentally, maybe it's, it's harder to do, but it's a good question. Let me, I'll try to summarize with a, a diagram that shows spinning about different axes for, let's just say a phone. So if we're spinning about this axis over here, this one, this is the case of spinning about the intermediate axis. So this is gonna be unstable. Unless you do something about it, we'll talk about how you could correct for this and use a rotor, a flywheel attached to your spacecraft and the interaction of that rotor with the spacecraft can actually stabilize even the intermediate axis and be handy. This is, so this one is about the maximum axis or major axis. Let's just say about the max inertia axis. Spin about the max inertia axis is stable, meaning if you're a little bit off, it'll just kind of wobble. It's not going to do anything crazy. So if you start off by, let's say, 0.2 degrees, you're just going to like execute a little cone of 0.2 degrees. You're not going to flip to the other side. 
This is spin about the minimum axis, but there is more we need to say about that. So spin about the minimum inertia axis is stable, kind of, and I could be more rigorous about what kind of is. It's not long-term stable. That construction we did before with the intersection of the sphere and the ellipsoid, that's sometimes called the pole hoed plot. I don't know where that comes from. You're not going to impress anybody at a cocktail party. The pole hoed plot is informative, but there's another effect that goes on. Even if we're out in space and you get this thing spinning and there's no torque on it, no moment, that means the angular momentum won't change. It'll be fixed, but the energy could change. You could dissipate away energy. So let me just expand on that. Energy, that's the total kinetic energy of rotation will generally dissipate meaning go down, you know, even in space. This could be due to vibrations of antenna, radiating heat. Energy will generally go down. And so as energy decreases, the min inertia axis becomes unstable. It just, it happens over a much longer time scale. But if you're concerned about a mission that could be lasting for weeks or months, even days, this instability of the satellite about the intermediate axis, that's a matter of seconds. So the time scale of this is just a longer time scale, but it will eventually take over. So if you want a picture of what's happening in terms of that pull hoed plot, this is an illustration on the left of what the dynamics looks like in the absence of energy dissipation. It's the same plot I had before. It's just more, you know, looks like a pencil drawing or something. You can see what's happening here. If you were to start about the minimum axis, there are some arrows moving around and you would just circulate around. And then there's these directions where bad things are happening. Like the intermediate, if you start anywhere near it, okay, you're just gonna go up. If you start near the maximum axis, you'll spiral around it. This is with no energy dissipation. This is with energy dissipation. And what we have is instead of there being closed curves, now we have spirals. And the intermediate axis is still unstable. Things are spiraling away might be hard to see, but they're spiraling away from the min inertia axis. So that makes it unstable. And then eventually, like if you were to follow one of these, it goes around and eventually it'll go around the sphere. And finally, settle in on going about the max inertia axis, or we should say rotation about the max inertia axis has the, now I hope this isn't confusing, it has the minimum energy. And maybe you've picked up from some of your physics-y courses that things tend to want to settle in a minimum energy state and they can't go any further than the minimum energy state. So even after all the energy that's possible to dissipate has been dissipated, this thing will still be spinning. It'll be spinning about that max inertia axis. So long-term, that's the stable axis. So that would be the axis you want to get things spinning about for a spacecraft. The space program learned this the hard way. We've learned from costly failures to do things differently. So there's this spacecraft uh, made by JPL, in fact. Explorer 1, the famous JPL, flies a drone on Mars. So Explorer 1, this was in 1958, and we were so proud of it. What did they say here? They say, America's first Earth satellite. Yay. But here's the problem with it. They had it spinning about this direction, if I were to draw it in. They had it spinning about this axis, right? It looks rocket shaped, right? It's rocket. And it's kind of natural if you've got some kind of rocket thing, you want to spin about that axis. So they were spinning about that axis, which is the minimum inertia axis, which might not have been so bad, but it had these antennas on it. You might not be able to see it, but it's got these antennas and they would wiggle and dissipate energy. That was a problem. And so the spin went unstable and we lost control of the spacecraft. <laughs> Whoops. I, I don't know what happened. It probably burned up in the atmosphere somewhere. But hey, it was our first. We learned from mistakes. We learned from mistakes. You've seen SpaceX trying to launch things and then have them land and then they explode like spectacularly. They learn from mistakes. NASA is a little bit more cautious about learning from mistakes, so they learn a little bit slower, but uh, they learn. A few years later, we had something good. So we learned our lesson. So this was by 1962. There was a, a 
something that looked like a R two D two looking thing. I don't have a picture. It, it kind of looks like a little Death Star or something. But it was spinning about um, a max axis. I think it was called the Telstar One. It's always good to name things one. It implies there's going to be more than one. Like, do we call the space station Space Station One in anticipation of more? I don't know. And it, yeah, so this was actually spinning at 200 RPM. I don't know what Explorer One was spinning, but because it was spinning about that minimum axis, it was a, it was a bad, bad scene. A few years later, you know, I didn't know whether this would be a history lesson. In 1964, first uh, geostationary satellite, and I think I even have a, a picture of it. SINCOM 3 applies to me. There must have been a SINCOM 1, SINCOM 2, the revenge. It's been stabilized about its maximum inertia axis. So that's good. It broadcast the Olympics live from Tokyo in 1964. So it was the first television broadcast across the Pacific to the US. So, right, satellites bring people together. Sometimes we, it's just kind of hard to get a major axis spinner. And so this, show, this is the major axis spinning. We need to do something in the case where we have maybe some oddly shaped thing. Or if we want to, like sometimes just the constraints of how you build the thing, the direction that you want pointed at the earth isn't going to be the max inertia axis. It might be one of the other principal axes. A solution was found to do this, to stabilize spin actually about any principal axis. And this is called dual spin stabilization. And this is in section 4.4. So spin stabilized satellites must be spinning around their major axis, the maximum axis. We can stabilize spin about any principal axis with the dual spin concept. So the idea is you've got a spacecraft and I don't know how to draw it. Something, you know, it could have lots of weird parts or whatever. It's like the ugliest spacecraft in the world. Uh, but here's the center of mass. And we've got principal axes. I'm going to try to make this so it doesn't look symmetric or anything. This is going to be something general where all the moments of inertia are different. But we will label this one B1, and then this one B2, and then this one B3. But don't get any ideas yet about which one's the major axis. We will put into this a rotor. So you could think of the rotor as a giant flywheel. Your fidget spinner, if you have one, is kind of a flywheel. So it makes it hard to turn it. Or this is a gyroscope. It's got this giant metal flywheel, right? It's got a ring of metal so that when I get it spinning, it wants to be spinning about the axis it's initially spinning. So we will put in a flywheel, a rotor. I'm going to try to make it look like that. There we go. So this is a flywheel. I don't yet know kind of exactly what direction it's rotating, but we'll call the rotation of the flywheel omega rotor or flywheel of the in spacecraft attached to the spacecraft. And it rotates about the B1 axis with the an angular velocity. And I'm just saying, yeah, a scalar angular velocity, capital omega. So what I'm showing here, B1, B2, and B3 are principal axes, but we haven't yet specified is B1 max, the intermediate, or the minimum, because it actually doesn't matter. You can stabilize about any direction with this concept if you have that rotor spinning at the appropriate speed. And it could be spinning in the positive sense, the way I've drawn it using the right-hand rule, or it could be spinning in the negative sense. You'll pick what that value of omega is depending on what the moments of inertia are. We'll do everything about the center of mass. So I'm not even going to specify center of mass. I will say that I S, this is the moment of inertia matrix or just inertia matrix of the spacecraft separate from the wheel, the flywheel. And then I W is the inertia matrix of the rotor or fly wheel, thus the W. The spacecraft rotates with a angular velocity that we'll call omega, the omega vector. So this is the rotation of that B frame with respect to an inertial frame and the flywheel, we're going to think of it as the frame of the wheel. So how, how quickly is the wheel rotating with respect to the inertial frame? Well, that's going to look like the rotation of the spacecraft with respect to the inertial frame, plus 
the flywheel rotates with respect to the spacecraft. Looks like that, angular rate, omega, the B1 direction. So if you want, this is the angular velocity of the wheel with respect to the B frame. So it rotates with the spacecraft, but then it has some component where it's rotating with respect to the spacecraft. We'll use this. We're going to write the total inertia matrix. The total inertia matrix is the inertia matrix of the spacecraft plus the wheel, IS plus IW. And then we could write the total angular momentum. So this is a vector. It'll be the total inertia matrix times the angular velocity. Remember, we're, we're just writing omega is omega of the satellite plus rotor complex, how that rotates with respect to an inertial frame. And then there'll be an extra bit. We'll, we'll write this as I... W S omega B1. IWS is the scalar moment of inertia of the flywheel about the B1 direction. About the direct, you know, the, the direction perpendicular to the wheel. So this is true even if we didn't have a principal axis, because we're using a principal axis, this would look like we'll just write it this way: I1, I2, I3. So it's diagonal. We'll differentiate so that we could use Euler's equation. So H dot, and remember what that is, that just means derivative of h with respect to the inertial frame is derivative of h with respect to that satellite fixed b frame plus omega cross h. And then we could work out what these terms are. This will be i omega dot plus, and it's conventional to write this quantity up here as little h. So it's I of the flywheel in the direction that it wants to spin times omega. It's written as little h. It has units of angular momentum, but in the literature, it's called little h. So I'll use little h. So this will be h dot in the b1 direction plus, and then the part that's due to this omega cross h will give us some stuff. I'll use that tilde notation, omega tilde i. I omega plus omega cross h b1. This is Euler's equation. The time rate of change of the total angular momentum would be equal to the total torque or total moment. But we're going to consider the case of no external torque. We're out in space. So no external torque. We can collect terms and rewrite this. So we'll get i omega dot equals negative omega tilde i omega minus h dot b1. So this comes from this cross product term of omega cross h b1. You'll get minus h omega three b2 plus h omega two b3. We get that. And what do we mean by this? So i, this is in the b frame. All of these vectors are written in the b frame. Meaning when I say omega, this means omega written in the body fixed frame, which is what we've been doing for weeks. So omega dot, that's just shorthand for in the body fixed frame, omega one dot, omega two dot, omega three dot. And what do we mean by H dot? H dot is I W S. That's a constant. The moment of inertia of the flywheel is just what it is from how it was manufactured, but omega could change, capital omega. And we could rewrite this using what the tilde matrix is and I, and I'm just gonna write out what it gives us in terms of omega one dot, omega two dot, and omega three dot. So this becomes three scalar equations. Omega one dot equals I two minus I three divided by I1, omega 2, omega 3. I'll do the other part in a different color, just to be weird. I, W, S, divided by I1, omega, capital omega dot. Omega 2 dot equals I3 minus I1. The part that I'm writing in black is, is just the free rigid body equations, and that's why I'm separating it out. This is the part that leads to instability about the intermediate axis. Omega three, capital omega. Omega three dot equals I one minus I two, I three. Omega one, omega two, 
minus IWS I3 omega 2 capital omega. So those are our three equations. If I were to, like I said, highlight parts, this is the free rigid body equations. So the same ones I wrote before, maybe just I moved something over. And this other part is due to the flywheel rotor. I want to say flywheel though, because W. And we might look at, okay, the claim is that the this dual spin spacecraft could allow us to stabilize motion about any axis. And so like meaning either, it doesn't matter if it's the max, the min, or the intermediate, we can stabilize. We are spinning about the B1 direction. We're calling the B1 direction the, the, the direction about which the flywheel is spinning, okay? So how could we stabilize this? And just to simplify, let's just say the rotor isn't changing its rotation speed. So we could say uh, capital omega dot is zero. Maybe we want to include that later, but let just to simplify, let's say we're already at some steady state. We've spun this thing up around in space. What do we need to do? So we need to think about what are the conditions for equilibrium. The conditions for equilibrium, meaning there's no change of the state anymore, would be that omega one dot and omega two dot and omega three dot are all equal to zero. Can we achieve that? And if we stare at this, you know, we can maybe deduce some things, but that's, that's what we want. And we can figure out ways that we can achieve that by adjusting what capital omega is. So let's just do a linear stability analysis. And this is specifically section 4.4.2. If we want to determine the stability of this dual spin spacecraft with a constant real wheel rate, so this is a constant wheel rate. I mean, maybe we would have a, another degree of freedom if we allowed that thing to change in response to perturbations or whatever, but let's just say constant wheel rate. We'll assume that the angular rate vector is an equilibrium rotation rate that I'll call omega E. So this leads to omega E. So this is our equilibrium angular velocity. Maybe we don't yet know what that is, but we're gonna say there's a equilibrium angular velocity, and we want to know what that needs to be, and will it be stable? So we're going to study small variations about this equilibrium position, or equilibrium angular velocity. I'll give it components so it's easier to deal with. So this is omega sub e, and this is just, right, it's always written in the body fixed frame. This is omega sub e1, omega sub e2, omega sub e3. And we want to know near equilibrium, we would say that the angular velocity is the angular velocity of equilibrium plus small variations. So I'll write those small variations as delta omega. So this is a vector of small variations. And we would, we'd first write down the conditions for equilibrium, and then we'll add the small variations. Omega E sub i's given from the conditions for equilibrium. So that means omega E1 dot equals, it's up above, so I'll just have to rewrite this, I2 minus I3 over I1, omega E2, omega E3, and that equals zero. Omega E2 dot is going to eventually equal zero, but it's I3 minus I1 over I2, omega E1, omega E2, and now we include the wheel, minus I W S over I two omega E three capital omega that needs to equal zero condition for equilibrium omega E three dot equals I one minus I two over I three omega E one omega E two plus I W S over I three and omega E two capital omega equals zero so now we would substitute in this into those rigid body equations up above with the flywheel and stuff. So if we we substitute in, so this means like omega one equals omega E one plus delta omega one and so on for each of them, omega E two plus delta omega two, omega three equals omega e3. So the equilibrium plus the small variation and then substitute in to the full ODEs. And I don't want to write out the whole thing. This gives you an idea of what it would look like. Omega e2 dot plus delta omega 2 dot 
equals I3 minus I1 over I2. And then for each of these omegas, we're also putting in what we've got for omega-1 and omega-3. Uh, so what would that be? Omega E1 plus delta omega-1 omega E3 plus delta omega-3 minus IWS I2 omega E3 plus delta omega capital omega. That's a lot. Yeah, it's a lot. So you've got that and then two others. And to simplify the math, we're just going to assume the spacecraft is spinning nominally, right? So you've got the first one and the second one. They, they both look like this. You multiply these two and anything that's like a delta omega one times a delta omega two, we'd say that's second order. It's a small thing times a small thing. So we just set it equal to zero. We just want to keep things that are first order in the small things and we'll get some equilibrium conditions. But we're first going to assume that the spacecraft is spinning nominally about its first body axis. That means B1, that would mean omega E is just, omega E the vector is just omega E1, the B1 direction, or if you want, omega E1, zero, zero. So omega E2 and omega E3 are zero. So they're just zero. That helps simplify some of this. So if you drop, the higher order terms, and we've assumed that we're spinning nominally about the B1, then we get the equations of motion for delta omega 1, delta omega 2, and delta omega 3. And sometimes these are called the departure equations of motion because it's departure from equilibrium. So if you get delta omega 1 dot equals zero, Delta omega two dot equals, hopefully you could see it from up here. Well, what would we get? I three minus I one over I two. We'll keep this term, omega E one, but omega E three is assumed to be zero. And anything that's second order in these little terms goes away. So I think all we're going to be left with is an omega E one times delta omega three. Okay, from, from this equation up here. That's for that first term. The second term minus I W S for I two. And notice omega E three is zero. And we'll be left with, I'll write it this way, delta omega three, capital omega. And then delta omega three dot, it's going to look similarly. I didn't write the equation for it, but you could go through the procedure and this is what you will get. Omega E one times Delta Omega two plus I W S over I three Delta Omega two capital Omega. And maybe you're noticing like, Oh, Hey, hold on. We've got a Delta Omega three and Delta Omega three. Here we've got a Delta Omega two and Delta Omega two. So we could kind of pull those out and let's just do that. What are you doing? Uh, yeah, I'm doing this. Delta Omega, uh, what was it? Three, there we go. And then same, same deal over here. Delta Omega two. So right, this thing to leading order Delta Omega one, it's constant. Meaning if we're off by 20 arc seconds per second. We just stay off by 20 arc seconds. It doesn't increase, doesn't de decrease. It's just whatever that initial spin is, that's, that's what we got once we spin it up. So these last two equations are decoupled and they are significant. These two are decoupled from the delta omega one dynamics. And we could kind of like what we did when we wrote things for the symmetric rigid body. Maybe you can notice here we've got Delta omega two dot equals delta omega three, but delta omega three dot equals delta omega two. So we could use the same sort of trick where you take the derivative of both of these and use them. So if I take this first one here and take its time derivative, well, I'll get delta omega two double dot equals I three minus I one over I two omega E one minus I W S I two capital omega. All of these things in here are constant. So there's no time derivative of them. We're assuming a flywheel that is not changing its speed. So capital omega doesn't change, but delta omega three dot, the departure from 
that that's what we're trying to find out what that is. But delta omega three dot we could write using the second equation. So I'll just substitute in what it is. I1 minus I2 for I3 omega E1. I'm going to run out of room. Plus, I mean, IWS over I3 capital omega delta omega 2. Let me rewrite this in a form that maybe we're used to seeing it. We're used to seeing these kinds of things. So move it over to the other side. I'll pick up a, I could either rewrite this or pick up a minus. I'm just going to rewrite it. I1 minus I3 over I2 omega E1 plus IWS I2 capital omega I1 minus I2 for I3 omega E1 plus IWS I3 omega delta omega two equals zero. Oh, okay. What do we call uh, all these things in this, in the parentheses are constant. So we're just going to call this K because it looks kind of like a stiffness for a spring, right? So then that means this just becomes delta omega two double dot plus K delta omega two equals zero. If the delta omegas confuse you, just um, look at this as x double dot plus kx equals zero. What's the condition for stability? For this to have a kind of sinusoidal stability, you need that k is positive. If k was negative, things will grow exponentially. Stability, meaning not leaving the zero case exponentially. Stability requires that K be positive. It's like a stiffness for a spring. You want positive stiff. If you had negative stiffness, you know, everything's falling apart. So the way to get K to be positive is that the product of these two things in the parentheses, right? We've got this one and then we've got this one. The product of them must be positive, which means Either they're both positive or they're both negative. And so depending on what we, and we'll do an example uh, next time, depending on what we get for I1, I2, and I3, we could, you know, like, well, what do we, how do we, what are we picking? How do we, what are we picking to make K positive? We're going to rewrite this in terms of a uh, scaled omega. So we're going to define a non-dimensional flywheel speed, which is the flywheel speed divided by the rotational speed of the spacecraft. This is non-dimensional. So if like omega E1 is 200 RPM, um, then capital omega will be something and omega hat will be just some non-dimensional number. If we define that, then we can write K in a convenient way. We could pull out some things that are constant omega E1 squared over I2, I3. And then we're left with I1 minus I3 plus omega WS omega hat. I1 minus I2 plus I WS times omega hat. The simplest thing is, if you say this thing has a given, you know, omega E, we can pick what that non-dimensional number is. So how fast do we have to spin compared to the spin of the spacecraft? How much does the flywheel have to spin to make K positive? And it will depend on different cases of what I1, I2, and I3 are. Basically, it means we're spinning about the V1 axis. Is that going to be the maximum, the intermediate, or the minimum inertia axis? And depending on in what case that is, we could pick that. So this will be specific to the spacecraft and it'll be based on the values of I1, I2, and I3. Basically the, the relative values. These will all be measured for any typical spacecraft in the hundreds of kilograms per meter squared, but we'll do an example next time. And I'll just, I think, leave it at that. All right, over and out.